I think we always talk in like generalities, like we want to improve the world. Like we want to make life better for our neighbors. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, like, tell me why, why do you care about that? And what personally um, has affected you or your experience in life to bring you to this point? Hi, everyone. I am Laura Petrolino. I am the marketing director here at NDTC. Uh, very much not Kelly. Uh, in fact, I think I'm probably half of Kelly's height. So we are bringing you this NDTC Q&A from much closer to the ground today. Um, but luckily, I have all these amazing trainers with me to uh, to really share some great insight. And before we dig into the questions and get your questions answered, I'm just going to go around the Zoom and have all of you introduce yourselves very quickly. Uh, so Coleman, you are right to my right. So why don't we start with you? Good afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Good day. Uh, my name is Coleman Elridge. Uh, not only am I uh, privileged to be uh, an NDTC trainer, I think this is my third or fourth year now uh, in in the NDTC family, uh, but I'm also very privileged and honored to serve as uh, the chair of the Kentucky Democratic Party. So uh, it is uh, great to spend this time with you and uh, thanks for making space for us today. Awesome. Atima, how about you next? Oops, and you are muted. Three years into this thing, of course, and it's still forget how to unmute. Um, anyway. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Dima. Um, I am from uh, Virginia, uh, specifically Northern Virginia, though I grew up in the Richmond area. I saw a couple of Richmond folks, I think, post in the chat. Um, and I have been involved in politics for quite a while. I've had the honor of being an NDCC trainer for the last mm, three years, I think, as well. Um, and my experience is both local party and having been a uh, a candidate for public office as well. Um, so, um, and state party and all of the things as many of us here on this call, our panelists, our fellow panelists have as well. So I'm um, looking forward to chatting with you more about how you all can build the infrastructure that we're going to need to be successful this year, because there are elections this year um, across the country and 24 and beyond. Awesome. Thank you, Christy. Great. Thank you so much. So yes, Good afternoon to most of us. I'm Christy. I go by she, her, hers pronouns. I uh, got my start in politics as a call time manager on a gubernatorial race back in the 2010 election cycle. So a great year for Democrats back then. Uh, surprised I uh, stuck around, but kept going with my electoral experience and ended up running for office myself for the Michigan State House in 2014. I won a competitive Democratic primary against two opponents and then won my uh, general election by 10 points when my seat was projected to be a Republican and was able to serve six years in the Michigan House. And now that I'm termed out, I spend my time coaching and training and supporting uh, state and local progressive candidates to run for office and win. So I run my own consulting firm now. And uh, this last cycle, we helped over 15 candidates in the Michigan State House and Senate, where we were able to claim majority for the first time in 40 years. So uh, we have a lot to celebrate here in Michigan, and we, we're just getting started. So thank you for having me. Amazing. Thank you all for being here. All of these trainers have such a great wealth of knowledge that you all are going to get to tap into today. So let's get started. Um, first question really is, it's the beginning of the new year. What are some ways campaigns, local parties can really try to get ahead of the curve? Uh, Tima, as you said, like there are elections this year, but even if there's not, there's no off years or off days. So what can folks do to really dive in right now? Yeah, um, two things that I always think of, and this is a great time to do strategic planning, um, whether you're a local party, a state party, or um, a candidate running for office, or an elected official is getting ready to run, maybe not this year, but in next year. Um, and that's really just thinking about new campaign plans, um, if you're a candidate, and then if you're a local party organization, really sort of what is your plan to build um be it an off year for your state or uh, an on year, um, as it were, if you have elections this year. Um, and so that, those are two key things I always think of in my mind, just like the planning piece. And then also the fundraising piece. I, you know, I know everybody's 
pretty exhausted um, with fundraising as it is, but it's a year round thing um, to start really planning for what your election cycle is going to look like, even more so if you have an election this year. So, um, you know, whether it's like a spring event, uh, what's the call time going to look like? What's your your mail, you know, your direct mail program going to look like? Do you fundraise via text? Um, you know, all of these things you should start be thinking of now. So those are two things that sort of pop in my mind when I think of what you could be using and sort of as I like to call the doldrums of January when it's pretty cold and everybody's just kind of waiting for, you know, a better month to come along, um, as they like to say about January. Um, you know, what you can be doing with the month of January. And we lost Coleman. So Christy, over to you. (laughs) (laughs) You know, the first thing that came to mind when you asked is just making sure that your end of the year items have been taken care of. So if there's any kind of thank you notes that still need to be sent or, uh, you know, appreciation um, gifts or things that you need to do to kind of close out last year. Uh, in the last cycle. I think that's especially important. Um, You know, I have a lot of candidates that did like Happy New Year postcards, for example, just to kind of continue to build their base of support and and make sure their list is good. So checking your list if you can. So sending out mail on your list or your email list to make sure that that's clean. So kind of take the time now that we have it to uh, make sure everybody that has been helpful along the way or that you have helped, you know, that you know that you're appreciative of them. And then also take some time to verify your own personal list. Coleman, how about you, especially from a state party perspective, what are some things local orgs can do or how, you know, what's what's going on at the state level that folks can really get involved in? So I, I think a couple of things, uh, you know, the, the first is, uh, well, what what everyone else has said. I, I think those are at, at both the state and local level, those, those are critical parts of the infrastructure that we oftentimes um, take for granted, but are are absolutely key um, to, to really ensuring that as we grow the party and, you know, we're, if you're at the local level, the state level, the national level, you know, we should always be in the, in the mindset of how do we expand our numbers. Um, so building that infrastructure, making sure that we're doing the fundraising, making sure that we're uh, doing the strategic planning and things like that, that, that that's all incredibly important. Um, I tend to also bring it back to kind of the, the, the people part of it. And I, I always call it the, the the gut check at the beginning of the year. So wh- where are we? You know, wh- where are we organizationally? Where are we in terms of messaging? You know, it, do, do people have a clear understanding of where we are and who we are and what we stand for? Uh, at the local level, uh, do, do, do does the local party have a clear sense of self? Uh, because what what may need to be articulated at the local level may not be as expansive of, of, of as what needs to be articulated at, at either the 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 national or the state level. And so it really is that gut check of are we in a place where we are clearly communicating our values, who we are, do we know what that is? Uh, and if if we if the answer to all of those questions or any of those questions. Uh, are yes, then what are the things that we need to do to get us there? Uh, so, uh, you know, here in Kentucky, this is a, a an election year for us. We have our statewide uh, races this year, and, and that's fundamentally what what we've begun uh, uh, the year doing is just really making sure that as we know who our candidates are, as we know the platforms that they're running on for all of those offices, how do we make sure that at, at, at the very base level, we are connecting to people, bringing people along with us, and, and ultimately turning that into success in November? Uh, that That's great. That is such a great foundational place and actually kind of leads me to our next question, um, which 
what are some of the underrated things that are important, like are game changers in a campaign plan? And Coleman, I think you so nicely laid out one of the big ones is figuring out who you are. Are you speaking to the right people? What are some other things that you all would add that are, these are the underrated things that people don't necessarily think when they're figuring out their campaign plan, but are game changers in the long run as they really build up that structure? Christy, I think you're oh, muted. That's a, oh, I was just talking to myself. That's a big question. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess a few things come to mind. You know, first, I'm always about expanding the electorate. So do you have specific policies in your district where you can get people to register to vote early or to request a ballot um, now? You know, in Michigan, you have to wait six months before an election in order to request a ballot by mail. So kind of just understanding your rules about voting and how to get people to participate more frequently. Uh, and then second, I think that's something that's often overlooked that I do think NDTC does a good job on is personal storytelling. So making sure that you are just taking some time to do some inward reflection and be like, what are the personal stories that have compelled me to be to this place in time and to do this type of work? And that can I can share and relate to others. Uh, I think that's incredibly difficult for a lot of people to kind of draw on personal stories and be able to then share those stories with others. And so the more we can think about that and practice that, I think the better you know advocate will be, activist will be, as well as candidate will be. So um, um, that's something yeah. that I've really challenged my candidates to. Because I think we always talk in like generalities, like we want to improve the world, <laughs> like we want to make life better for our neighbors. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, like, tell me why, do, why do you care about that? And what personally um, has affected you or your experience in life to bring you to this point to do this? Um, we have for context for folks, we have a story of self-training that really speaks to exactly what Christy was talking about. And Jaco can put that in the chat and then a creating your core political message that speaks a little bit more to what Coleman was talking about before. Um, and Jaco will put both those links in the chat that the, the, that definitely hits those two points that both of you mentioned. That's great. Atima, anything that uh, you want to add to that from underrated campaign messages or campaign plan tactics? Yeah, definitely. I agree with what Christy said and thinking about, you know, story of self. Like I was talking to a candidate elected official this morning. They're trying to think of what they will do next. And they're new in the role that they're in. And it's, you know, thinking about what's your story, who you are, how you build relationships is a big piece of it. Um, and how you communicate to people that you are, who you say you are, how you sort of build community, how you build, you know, a bench of folks, um, you know, that are, are part of a larger um, kind of political community, um, especially if you're somebody who's going to be moving up, like, are you building, you know, um, sort of a, a, a vision of the type of like kind of campaign that you we want to run? But also one of the things, and it's more like brass tacks that can get plans. I think a lot of people have overlooked um, the digital component of campaigns and not just from like, I mean, a lot of people are more attuned to it because the pandemic required that. Um, but I think also in how uh, you should really think about your presentation online. So building, having a campaign website, I'm still amazed at the number of folks who don't um you get down to like really smaller races um so having a campaign website having a specific branding that speaks to you like don't just up a website and be like blue and white democratic colors call it a day like you know like when i think of like shirley chisholm running for president or or kamala harris whose kind of colors were sort of modeled off of like shirley chisholm's candidacy like your colors your logo all of that is sort of your branding so who are you trying to communicate you are um, through your materials, having up a Facebook page, being present on Twitter, trying to figure out your target audience, going back a little bit to what um, Christy was saying about who are the people you are trying to reach and where are they online and really building those presence early. So, you know, you're not thinking like six months down the line, oh, we have a Facebook page. We should probably run some digital ads or we should run a texting program without really thinking about building a genuine online community um, from which you can fundraise through emails and Facebooks instead of 
doing what I think everybody really just did not like last cycle, which was blasting a whole bunch of folks who've given the Demo- you know, Democrats and saying, hey, you want to give? I was like, you are three states over from me. I don't even know who you are. Why are you in my phone? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> like you want to, as a candidate and as a campaign staffer, be able to like reach out to folks um, who are going to give to you because you've been building a relationship with them authentically online. So yeah, anyway, it's my speech. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, I, as marketing director, I will add in here, when you are working in politics, you are automatically working in marketing. Like yeah. everything that <laughs> everything that everyone's added here today, like you have to think of yourself as both being in politics and as a marketer. So branding, uh, having those stories and those messages that really directly relate and resonate with the folks that you are talking to, having very specific messages too. Like you don't have to be the person for everyone. You have to be the person for the voters that are voting for you in your community. So, and I I just love that you brought up branding because it is really true. Like if you think about some of these candidates that really stick out in folks' minds, it's because like you could take away their photo and their name, but you would see their brand and it would connect. And Mm -hmm. so I always like, like in marketing, we always like to think, Take away all the identifiers. If you see us, if you see our colors, our image, will you say, oh, yeah, that's us? And you can think about it the same way for your candidacy. Like, take away everything else. If they see your messages and your images, will they know it's you? Um, And then you've got something memorable. So I love that. That is is awesome, awesome uh, points on all from all of you here. Um, Okay, so, you know, you've all mentioned party infrastructure in some way especially locally, let's look at that a little bit more. How can non-electoral organizing really build the bench in our local communities, especially starting early now when there's not as much buzz in election? What is the stuff that our local leaders here today and all the volunteers and candidates working can really do to build that bench and that infrastructure? So I'll, I'll I'll jump in to to, to this one, and, and I'm going to piggyback uh, off of something I was going to say about uh, the the previous question, which is I, I think one of the most underrated um, actions uh, that that uh, we we tend not to 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 really engage in uh, in an intentional way throughout the party uh, it, it is having conversations with the various constituencies that support the party outside of election cycles. So how do how are we continuing to to engage? How are we coming to the table very um authentically and humbly as the party or as a candidate or as a, a campaign understanding that the conversations that we're having may eventually yes translate into votes, but that the expectation of of voters is that we actually do, as Democrats, give a damn about their lived experience. And so how do we build into the infrastructures that we're creating, the, the capacity and the bandwidth to have those conversations authentically, intentionally, and act on them uh, in in big or small ways. You know, it, not everything is going to be a bill passed and signed into law, but but there are things that we can do in terms of being more inclusive, in terms of the outreach that we do, in terms of engaging. Uh, you know, one one of the the, the things that that I, I think a lot of uh, party chairs at, at both the state, uh, or, or I will say at the state level, uh, deal with is. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of local parties that are, um, frankly, almost non-existent. And the reason for that is you've had the same people for 20, 30 years running the party. And what has also happened in that time is uh, the bench that we could have been growing and not just benches of candidates, benches of donors, benches of of campaign managers and treasurers and and, and communication specialists. I mean, the, the, the fabric of what it takes to really be successful at this stuff. Those folks have gone and done something else because they were turned off 
years ago by a structure that did not embrace whatever it was that they were willing to bring to the table. And so as we talk about building infrastructure for the future, we have to make sure that, that, that we are creating the space for people to come and be seen and be a part of the process. And, and, and no, you know, not everybody's going to be chair at the same time and, and not everybody's going to get what they want. But, but in, in the middle of all of that, uh, you know, on, on both ends of the extreme it is a, a capacity to build something that is meant to last. And, and the reason I, I, I kind of am taking that approach is we as Democrats are um, almost comical at times in the fact that every, every time a campaign season comes around, we are reinventing the will while our, our friends on the other side of the aisle are investing in what they've already created, good, bad, or, or, or indifferent. And so th the time and energy and resources that it takes for us to just gear up as we're reinventing the will, we've, we've lost time and capacity and, and votes uh, to folks who we know their agenda is horrible for the country, for our, for our cities, for our counties, for our state, but they are so far ahead organizationally because they they aren't starting from scratch. And so we, we have to, to I think, um, be much more intentional about how we build the capacity all the way around, how we humble ourselves to give up that title, you know, because at the end of the day, what good is having the title of a chair or, or, or a member of an executive committee if you've lost all the seats that you've had and you're not competitive anymore. Um, those are difficult conversations to have, but but it, I think it's what's required of us to be competitive uh, moving forward. And uh, it, it's just something that we aren't comfortable doing yet as Democrats. But when we, when we get there, um, we can actually build sustainable, long lasting infrastructure at every level. It's interesting, we have our great democratic debrief at the end of every cycle. And the number one thing we hear every year from folks is exactly that. Like they stepped into a uh, you know county chairmanship and they had nothing. They, they had to start from scratch. They had to rebuild, they had to. And so uh, it's, it's so interesting hearing you say that because you're right. That's like, we've lost so much time that everyone else is already moving forward. So, um, so I love that. And, and the non-transactional nature of just really building those relationships and speaking to people when we don't need something from them, when we just want to build that community. So important. Yeah. I guess I would um, add to that just from experience of having been in local parties and seeing state parties that have definitely gone about building the infrastructure and then um, in places where they ha just have it, like have and have it. And, you know, the one thing that, you know, you can do to sort of build that bench is, yes, having a lot of these conversations, your precinct captains, um, your volunteer organizers, uh, a lot of your committee people um really just, and it's like, we have a couple of great trainings. I know um, with the local, with the national democratic training committee that really focus on how to do this, but year round, just getting to know folks in your area. The one thing I love about the area that I live in now is we have precinct captains who spend time, even when it's the primary, um, they call around to a bunch of Dems who've signed up either to be a volunteer or folks who are listed as having been sort of active with them at some point and ask them if they want to volunteer hand out lit at the polls. And it's just general lit about how to get involved in the Democratic Party, stuff coming up in the cycle. Um, you know, they let folks know about events, they get people on newsletters, they start building relationships. Those folks who are precinct captains can then start getting a lot of that experience and slowly start moving up the ranks from precinct captain to now Maybe they're the area chair for a few precinct captains that are and are you know monitoring a few precincts and 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 helping to build the next group of leaders and then they kind of ascend to the point that they're you know local party chair and that's that's been the case with quite a few of our folks um, in the area that I've worked in as folks who started off as just volunteers like just phone banking and canvassing had no title had no role and were given opportunities to excel um, and you know become leaders in their own right. 
um, and eventually went on to, you know, run the local party. Some ascend even higher or they end up running for public office. Um, but that's sort of the way that you're going to, to build the bench is, is really getting to know the folks in your community who um, care about the Democratic Party, care about the Democratic Party values, um, want to be engaged. You know, you can't be surprised when people don't turn out for your candidates um, if you're not talking to them. Uh, quite frankly, there's a whole bunch of folks who are registered, probably even registered, especially in states where there's party registration and are, you know, called and engaged, you know, and so they don't vote as regularly. You know, they have lies that they're living, especially in these last few years. It's been hard on a lot of folks. And so, you know, you have to make the extra effort. You can't just assume everybody remembers when there's election day. And especially when you're in certain parts of like, especially the South where elections are just by design, sometimes at very weird times of the year. Um, you know, it's like, oh, it's a city council race in March. Oh, there's like an off, you know, the entire General Assembly is up in Virginia. The guess you have to vote again. Yes, I know we just finished voting in 22 for Congress, but, you know, it's like not everybody. I track this because like Christy, I'm also a consultant and I have to for my work. But I have to know that other folks don't who are living their daily lives. Like my parents just recently asked me, wait, we had a special election? What the heck? We didn't get contacted. And like, they're the parent of a kid who does this for a living. And they're like, do they actively vote? So it's about really staying in touch a lot with these, these everyday voters who will come out but you have to have these conversations. You have to build these relationships with them. And if they want to get involved and they want to volunteer, give them more opportunities to excel, bring their ideas to the table, become leaners in their own right. Eventually, like, you know, retire a whole bunch of us so we can go on and do <laughs> other things in life. So the curse of knowledge yes. is very real for all yeah. of us in politics. Yeah. Like, all of us that are here today, we are not the norm. We are nerdy political people that like love to track this stuff. So do break out of that curse of knowledge of thinking everyone is in this world of thinking about it all the time. They're not. So yes, that's such a great point. Even your parents, even though they yeah. love you. Yeah. <laughs> Christy. Yeah. Oh, everything Atima said, that was awesome. <laughs> Great job. Uh, I had three points I wanted to make. One is definitely is now it's time for training. So I know there's Staff Academy going on with the NDTC. In Michigan, we have the Great Lakes Political Academy. So if you're in Michigan, please sign up for that. Uh, we have, you know, kind of long-term training about infrastructure building, campaign management support, and really how to get plugged in to our electoral side of politics. Uh, to, you know, we have a state democratic convention coming up, you know, make sure that you know about any kind of state party happenings that that may be uh, in the future or your local democratic party meetings to so make sure you're signed up for those and attending those. So kind of just get plugged into the existing infrastructure and see if you can contribute and help build towards that and perhaps even run for a position or be a leader within your own local party or the state party. And then finally, uh, you know, New year, new legislature here in Michigan. So get to know your new representatives. If you have new elected officials in your area, uh, get to know them, you know, maybe on a personal basis. If you have a new local elected official or a state elected official uh, that you like and are supporting, uh, perhaps offer to host a house party or a meet and greet, uh, even now to say like, oh, we have a new state representative. You know, I would like to introduce you to my neighbors or my friends. Uh, and make that available. Um, and that can really help, you know, build that relationship. And then you can then reach out to your network to help kind of build Democratic Party infrastructure as well. So, um, so those are some recommendations that I have. Love it. That is awesome. One thing I've well, seen a Laura, little bit in the chat. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Coleman. Oh, can, can I say two quick things? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the first is, um, uh, I, I think in terms of building infrastructure, one of the things that I, I find here in, in Kentucky and in, in just rural areas, uh, rural states, uh, not all, but uh, I, I can speak from my own experience, is that as 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 we look at how to build, for instance, statewide, um, you know, you, Often the conversation is, okay, who's our next candidate for governor going to be? Who, who, who's our next state ledge, you know, person going to be? Um, and and I, I would urge us to to always remember um, 
that that local level is incredibly important. Um, it's an, it's incredibly important for partisan races, and increasingly, it's incredibly important for nonpartisan races because our friends on the other side are weaponizing those and making them partisan anyway. And so, as we recruit people uh, to be a part of the process, I, I think it it behooves us to to really illustrate the importance of of being active at all levels and, and really that in the moment that we're in, and I would actually argue all moments, but especially the moment that we're in, uh, that it really is all hands on deck. So that if, you know, it, it's not about looking at, well, I'm just involved in local politics. Look, the the, the majority of, of, of the, the prism by which the majority of people see politics is how it affects them in their neighborhood, in, in their local associations, um, you know, how the school board's decisions affect their tax rates or, or, or the education of their children. And so I, I don't want to lose sight of the importance of really doubling down on making those investments at, at the local level, because oftentimes that person that you recruit for the, the school board five, 10, 15 years from now can be the candidate for governor or can be a, a state senator or, 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 or anything else. And so uh, that becomes in, uh, critically important. And, and I would also say in terms of, and this is kind of linking the first uh, question with this one, um, communication is key but plain and honest communication is key. We as Democrats tend to try to pressure test and, uh, and poll and uh, you know uh, have 18 different committees to figure out what we want to say about a sentence. And I, I, I remember just personal anecdote, when I came into the chairmanship, um, my mother told me, she was like, you know, Coleman, like just, just, Promise me that the way you talk to people when you're at Kroger is the way that you're going to talk to people as chair. And so, yes, every once in a while you will. Now, I'm not recommending this. I'm just, again, from personal experience. Every once in a while you will log in to Twitter and you will see me drop the F-bomb because what the Republicans did in the legislature that day or what they're trying to do in the United States Senate or, or the House is so bad that I don't have a cute word. I'm not going to the thesaurus. I'm going to tell you authentically how I feel about it. And then I'm going to tell you as Democrats, not only why we're against it, but what we're for. And, and I think what we have lost it, it, at all levels, but especially locally, is the ability to just connect with people on a human level. And so that when you see me in the grocery store or the or, or the pickup line when I'm, I'm getting my kids from school, you understand that if you ask me a political question, I'm going to tell you the truth unvarnished because that's what I owe you, both in terms of you asking me the question and I'm going to turn around and ask you to support the, the people and the policies that that and the party uh, that I support. And so I owe you that truth. A and I, I think that really can take hold at the local level, because at the end of the day, uh, one of the other things that we tend to do as Democrats is we will build a party infrastructure around a candidate instead of building it around people. Candidates go away. Our, our, our connection and need of people remains. And so I, I think that's also really key in terms of building a sustainable infrastructure is speaking in an authentic and plain language that people can resonate with and it connects with them and, and they can then see themselves reflected in either the joys of the party uh, and, and the successes of it or the frustrations of it uh, and, and the frustrations of the moment that we're in. And um, that's not always thought about very intentionally, but I think it is a critical component to how we build things uh, and, and do it in a way where it is sustained and successful. Right, that's beautiful. Yeah, people get lost in the narrative. You have to bring it to them. Like you have to help people understand why it matters and let them trust you. I, I think it goes back to all the things that you all have been saying, like, don't make it transactional. Talk to people and know that they don't get, they don't necessarily know what we know. They don't know that school board candidates and secretary of state candidates and things that you're doing right now locally 
are those big issues that they're hearing about that do affect their community? Um, so it's your job not to just get them to vote for you or to you know vote your way, but to get them to understand how it relates to their life. That's uh, that's amazing. Such a game changer. Um, I've seen some things in the uh, chat about really like in we have so many learners here that are in red districts. And I know all of you have worked in red districts as well are working in them and people really struggling with getting volunteers or folks to be motivated when they feel like they're constantly just having loss after loss. What are some techniques that you all have used to get that motivation going for folks uh, in the light of not always having successes um, and often facing a lot of obstacles? Yeah, I think a couple of things that I've learned has been about the importance of like first off, acknowledge it's, you know, depressing as all get out, you know, being in a district that's super red and it keeps going the wrong way. And you're like, why am I here? Why <laughs> maybe I'm looking to move somewhere else, you know, for some folks. And, and that has been the case. But, um, you know, I think for those who want to stay and still do the work, you know, there's a long game to be played, right? Um, I think one thing that Republicans do very well is that they understand the long game. Like we are seeing the results in these last two, three, four years, especially with the Supreme Court of people who in the 80s, like kind of envisioned a different type of Supreme Court, a different type of Congress and set about building those plans a very long time ago. And we're losing in climates where the no, this district is blue. You're never going to win. And now like they're in charge, right? Um, so so we have to really think about it that way as well. We have some great organizations here in Virginia who do some of that work. Um, one group uh, for those who are in Virginia, a rural ground game, and they really go about identifying great candidates who can do local, uh, who can run local campaigns, invest in the communities, knock on doors that haven't been knocked on in a long time, because they'll be like, oh, that area is gone. Well, is it really gone though? <laughs> like, and when I say that, I mean, the people who are voting are maybe the, you know, the diehard Republicans watching Fox News, but there's a swath of folks who just aren't engaged in the political process at all. Like who will open the door and see a Democrat and be like, I had nobody knock on my door who's a Democrat in 10 years. And I just thought we weren't here. Um, and so, you know, have kind of retreated into themselves. But what they have realized is that there are other folks like them. And then all of a sudden they're building community. Right. Um, and I think that's one of the things is like, yeah, you're going to work for this candidate who may go from losing 60, 40 to maybe losing 60, 45 or maybe event or no, 60, 45, 45, because I can't do math quick, that quickly right now. <laughs> but then the margin is slowly like shifting right and it's going to be a long game who knows maybe you're also building in a place that you can flip a city council that's happened in certain parts of virginia um maybe it's not the house of delegates race that you're going to win or the state senate race but all of a sudden you've got a board of supervisors candidate you've got somebody who's running for sheriff who shares more of your values if folks in georgia had given up like Georgia would not like have like Warnock and Ossoff as the U.S. senators. Sure, Stacey lost her election, but there's a whole swath of folks elected in parts of the state of Georgia who otherwise would not have been had if they had just given up and said these areas are red. We can't build. You were seeing counties in Georgia flipping that like five, ten years ago. Everybody's like red. Not flipping, not flipping. But people just kept working, finding the voters, doing that year round day-to-day -day work and finding community with others who believe that this community could potentially change. And so I think those are the things that I talk about. It, it's, it's, it's about the long game. It's also about building community and, um, and, and finding unique ways to do that and knowing not everything's going to be a win um, immediately, um, but that you might be surprised at what happens if we get together and we organize. So 
to pull in my best Kelly Dietrich quote uh, to have some representation for him here. It is a movement, not a moment. Uh, And I think everything you said just sums that up. Like we are in this for the long game. We want to change communities for decades to come. And that sometimes starts with just being the first Democrat that someone meets. That's not what they hear about on Fox News that actually has a lived experience like them that's worried about the same issues in their community as them. And so that doesn't always translate into a win right away, but sometimes it translates into, to what Coleman was saying, that connection of making that connection and saying, oh, these aren't the big, scary people that I hear about from Sean Hannity. These are actually people who care about the same things I care about and care about the community we're in. So that's, that's awesome. Anything else to add, Christy or Coleman to that? I have uh, two points just to add to uh, echo off of what Atima said about, especially the nonpartisan elections. So is there any opportunities for wins in your community that perhaps is is nonpartisan? So can you kind of take away the Democratic label and therefore elect Democrats in a nonpartisan way? So I definitely look for those opportunities. Uh, But something else that also comes to mind is what can you count as a win? So can you make, you know, get 10 volunteers when you had zero? (laughs) You know, that's our win. You know, can we expand uh, our Democratic donor base, you know, to a certain number of individuals? You know, that's a win. So oftentimes when we're organizing in red communities, you know, and there's no way in hell we're going to win this election with our Democratic candidate, what can we win? You know, we can make sure that we walk the district three times and we're talking to voters, right? And that's a win for our our team, for our, our campaign. Mm-hmm. Right. I so, would add, yeah, yeah I would so add trying to that. figure out other wins besides the ultimate uh, electoral victory. You know, yeah. what else can we uh, classify as a win? Yeah, a local county Dem chair I knew in a rural area, he just worked when I was running on the campaign and he worked with me to recruit volunteers in his area so he could build up his local party and build up a regular habit of canvassing with those folks and getting them used to the community. And his goal was just to do that. But at the end, actually, that consistent work that they did all summer into the fall, uh, the county went at that point in time, 51, 49 for the first time in like a generation. Wow. <laughs> and wow. because they've just been like just fine finding doors, like like trying to use scores to determine if people were receptive, you know, mm-hmm. to Democrats. And just want to add, um, before passing off to Coleman, that there was also a point in the chat about also sometimes you may not win those local races, but it can contribute to a larger statewide turnout. I say here, you know, in Virginia, we have Glenn Youngkin for Virginia because he ran up the score uh, in rural areas And he knew he was going to lose the blue areas, but he still played and tried to run up the Republican voters in the blue areas. Had the Democratic side of the ticket, like really run up the score in rural areas. So like maybe we were not losing by like 30 points. We were losing by like, you know, 25, 20 points. We had gained a 10, you know, 10 point margin that would have helped us statewide in our wins. So, you know, even if it's not just for winning local races, but for, you know, protecting statewide majorities, rural areas can be very critical. Yeah, I I would just quickly add, you know, one of one of the things that I often say, because, you know, I I I was raised in rural Kentucky, I'm I'm now raising my family in rural Kentucky, and my lights just went off. Oh, goodness. Uh, Let me finish this, this, uh, this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll figure out what's just happened, Uh, is uh, that um, in in rural America, um we have to we have to level set and what i mean by that is yes it is generational but you know i i probably say this at least once a day to a democrat in some rural part of of kentucky there has never been a successful movement that has changed our country for the better that happened overnight and that was not generational to the point that people had to sow seeds of things they would never see bloom. And the unfortunate reality of, of, and this is what I mean by level setting, that the unfortunate reality of where we are right now as a country politically 
is that we aren't in the reaping phase of, there we go. Uh, we aren't in the reaping phase of, 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 of politics in, in a lot of rural areas. We're in the sowing phase. And understanding that is both critical to, to, to kind of understanding the, the, the assignment, right? Uh, and to understanding that at the end of the day, how we stop a Mitch McConnell isn't by playing his ball game, but it's by creating the avenue by which we can dismantle everything that he's done. You know, he's 30 years, 40 years into to, to the crazy in Kentucky. So I, I can't play on his on, on his field uh, of trying to take on his crazy. We do that. We absolutely can do that. And, and we have to reaffirm that Democrats can, in fact, walk and chew gum at the same time. And so because we can, we can both in the moment field candidates and put together campaigns that challenge X, Y and Z, while also planting those seeds at the local level to say, you know, under 40 years of Mitch McConnell, things haven't gotten better for rural Kentucky. They've actually gotten worse. Here are the ways they've gotten worse. Here are the ways that that life expectancy has gone down, not up, that uh, incomes have gone down, not up. He owns all of those, those things because of policy that he either put in place at the national level or advocated for at the at, at the local and state level. So we have to, we as Democrats at this moment are responsible for building the thing that dismantles those things so that my kids have a better quality of life and Kentucky's quality of life is better in the future. I may not live to actually see all of those things and I hope I do, but it is the right thing to do. And, and so I, I think we get trapped in rural America at times, trying to play on the same field uh, and try to do the same things. And, and so we often then, be, because we understand how our people talk and what, what is needed, when we don't get the resources, when we don't get the attention, when we don't get, um, you know, anything other than the blame for, you know, why Democrats are losing uh, at, at the state and national level, um, that in itself depresses everything. And, and so I think there's a bit of level setting and truth telling that we have to do in terms of the moment that we're in and the expectations of that moment and the things that we can do and the things that we are building to do. And, and, and understand that both trajectories can be acted on at the same time. That's so helpful. We we get so many folks uh, that work in rural areas that I think you just answered a ton of questions for people in the chat and people that some of the learners that we have every day. It, it's, it's a hard area to be in, but you articulated that so beautifully. Um, we are very close to time. These kind of like run by because all this great discussion. Um, so I'm trying to kind of summarize some of the questions in the chat and give them to our folks really quickly. So quick thing that maybe we can just do a quick like 60 second drop uh, from each of you is we've had a lot of questions in the chat about really organizing young folks. How do you get the young folks involved? How do you get them active? What's the best way to, I mean, especially, you know, we're talking about kind of generational patterns, generational voting patterns. Like how can we reach out to those young folks, get them involved? We know from research that um, this younger generation is interested in being active. What are your best strategies to, to really help them understand the important role they play and get them active? Well, I think one thing is, I remember I was on a call, uh, so I think it was like right after Roe was all returned, and um, it was a state senator um, who said, you know, older, um, maybe a boomer, and she said, you know, we need to get young people, you know, caring about abortion rights. And I was like, hey, what? And I was so confused myself because I was like, you know, just like I'm on a college campus, I see them and I just know, you know, I want them to be engaged. I'm like, oh, they're engaged. 
in their own spaces, they're engaged around the issue. Like when you look, we've talked a lot about abortion funds and, and all of this, like what you should donate to. And I was like, who's, you know, who's running those abortion funds? Mostly folks under the age of 50. <laughs> Mostly folks under the age of 45. Like I was on an abortion fund board and there was like 20 somethings running it, raising hundreds of thousands of dollars, like calling their friends, using texting, doing bolathons, getting on TikTok, you know, like getting on Twitter. Where to bring in young folks, one, identify where they are, like don't assume that they don't care about these issues. You may not see them being cared about these issues because they're not at the local Dem meeting. That doesn't mean they don't have issues they don't care about. Um, Think of the organizations that they gather on. Sunrise is an organization that really, really is organized around young people caring around um, climate. A March for Our Lives is one that's really organized around caring about young people and, and, and gun violence, right? These are people who are already motivated by the issues. You now have the uh, student loan debt campaign that has a lot of young people engaged um, in, in, in that. Those are places that you can naturally go to and find folks who are already gonna be very politically inclined it do that you know and that's my my first thing is find out where they are find out what they care about um don't make a lot of uh, uh, assumptions um so yeah those are those are the first things that i i definitely i think about through my own just youth organizing it's just you know every time i hear that i'm like oh we need to get them engaged i'm like they are engaged they're marching they're out there <laughs> Like with any other community, go, like when we talk about going to reach out to black voters and we're thinking of different areas, we talk about barber shops and all these places where black people like to gather. It's the same thing. And, and thinking about like younger people, where are they online? What do they like to do? What are the issues they care about? And then go meet them on their turf and engage them. That's what we should be doing as party. So. We had a reproductive freedom ballot initiative on our Michigan ballot and you know, there was getting, we were getting some news reports that there was lines on college campuses for uh, same day registration and voting. And sure enough, I went up to University of Michigan's campus and the line it was over three hours long to register and vote same day. The last student to vote voted at 2 a.m. on election night. So young people, they are engaged and they do care about and everything that Atima said is right on. It's like, we just have to go find them. And I would just add to everything that she said is ask them to be leaders in our movement. Like, mm -hmm. can you ask them to take responsibility, to have a role, to organize their friends and family? Uh, you know, the more we can kind of pass the torch and empower the next generation, I think the better. And then they will then take it and run with it. Uh, amen to, to 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 everything that that's already been said. I, I would say uh, two two things. Uh, one directly to any young person on the call today. Um, you know, uh, Atima, I was thinking about when we met through Young Democrats of America, and a conversation that Atima and I had as as I I I I, I was running for office uh, in YDA for the first time. Um, that that really connected me to her was this notion that that we were extraordinarily sure that we deserved a seat at the table, and were persistent to the point of almost being politely arrogant enough to demand it. Uh, and you have to, you have to, you have to, as young people have that certainty about your worth in the process to demand that seat when it when it's not available and to dare the infrastructure that is to to either not give it to you or to have the the, the courage of our democratic conviction to understand that we are a stronger party when we embrace the voices and lived experiences of people at every walk of their life and that you just don't become uh, a uh, a voice within our party when you achieve a certain age and or a certain stature within the party. Um, so I think that is a critical component that for, for, for a young person that is just like, I, I don't see it and I don't see the avenue, just demand the damn thing. And, and trust me, like, 
you'll get it. That I, I am living proof. You, there is no reason I should be the chair of the Kentucky Democratic Party other than uh, at 18, I was like, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Y'all gonna have to deal with me. And at 40, I'm still here and, and a part of the process. Um, the, the other thing quickly that I, I, I would say is um, that we have to, uh, on the other side of that, uh, again, this goes back to all the other conversations that we're, we're having, humble ourselves to ask questions that one, we actually don't know the answer to. And when we hear an answer that makes us feel uncomfortable, not do what we typically do, which is just to turn it off and revert to, well, that's not the way that we've done it. Uh, because young people are active and they are motivated. The, the, the central question is, will they be active and motivated in our party and the work that we're doing, or will they be active and motivated in other capacities that share our values, maybe share our, our end game, but because they have been turned off, don't share the need to be involved in a process in a party that doesn't value them. And, and so that humility for us as Democrats um, is a necessity uh, to reach people where they are and to then not only do that, not do it in terms of it being lip service, but actually do it, hear it, put it into action and, and grow from it. And that that's hard to do, but um, it's going to be critical because uh, like I've got a 13 year old who wants to go into politics, but he's like, you know, I don't want to be in politics just because I'm your son. I have a voice and I have thoughts and I have, and he does. What is the avenue for them, for him at 13 to be a part of that process? Mm -hmm. And I would also say I saw one person say sort of, you know, or like saying in the chat about, you know, there's high sort of affiliation of millennials and Gen Z um, as independents and don't definitely don't make assumptions. Like I always say, like with folks who say they're independent, they lean one way or another. Right. And <laughs> most of those young people came out and voted for Democrats in 22, standing in line until 2 a.m. on college campuses because they saw what's happening and they don't like it. Um, but they do need to be engaged repeatedly. Um, something that was said in Young Dems is through studies that we learned that uh, if you engage a young person and get them to vote for a party, you know, more than three times, they become affiliated with that party for life. And, you know, that's what we should be doing. Um, you know, because if you talk to these folks, they are going to agree with you on most of the issues that the Democratic Party cares about. Uh, they're just skeptical of the political process because, I'm sorry if you're like a young person on a college campus, you, this last 20 years, especially in our country, between, you know, Obama being like kind of even like the highlight, right? It's like you had the, the, the wars, you had 9-11, you have, you know, pandemic, you know, you have student loan debt, you have rising costs, the point where even if you graduate with a college degree, you get on the other side of it and it can't even afford to make a living because of the debt you're in and it's more expensive now. <laughs> and so it's a very different world. Um, than the one in which my parents were boomers who grew up in. And, and so, you know, they're like, how does politics, while I care about these issues, how does politics make sense in my life? That's something that every voter asks, but specifically a younger person. Um, and so um, just wanted to throw that out there that I think, again, like people are, are not going to affiliate with parties if they're not having conversations with folks as to why they should affiliate, why they should get involved, why they should be at the table. Um, so yes, they should feel arrogant about getting involved, but folks should also like welcome them to the table, um, their leadership, their new ideas, uh, Democratic Party, let's get on TikTok or whatever that is. And you're like horrified, like, what is this TikTok thing? But like, you're going to find a swath of voters. Biden's administration um, brought all of the TikTok influencers under 30 to town because they wanted them to get um, to their millions of followers, each one of them had, who are under the age of 30, to talk about the administration's accomplishments because they know they need young people. Even though, like, Biden's like, what is this TikTok thing? <laughs> Probably most of the people in the administration were too, but they knew it was the smart move, right? So, um, definitely just want to say that, like, again, going back to how you build the bench and how um, for the long term. Amazing. 
Uh, wow. I, I feel like I need to watch this over and over again to absorb all this great insight. Thanks to all of you that were here with us today, asking questions, being so engaged. Thank you to all of our amazing panelists today. Um, so valuable. Such a great, exciting way to kick off the year. Thank you to all of you, uh, all of our panelists for being here today. Thank you to all of you learners here today, whether you're running, you're a local leader, you're a volunteer or a staffer, you are making a difference. Uh, and we are so excited to head into this next cycle with all of your energy behind us. Thanks, everyone. See you all soon. Hey, I'm Kelly Dietrich, the CEO and founder of the National Democratic Training Committee. For more like this, head on over to traindemocrats.org. Thanks for watching.